is that American Sign Language or uh, that uh, Assembly of God Sign Language or Clayton Barth Sign Language? <laughs> anyway, I was saying how appropriate it was. Uh, Crystal mentioned before service that this chapter goes right along with the weather outside. So we are in Genesis chapter 7, and one of the chilling things about this and something that we all need to address and we all don't like to talk about, and that's what are we going to do when God's patience runs out? What are we going to do? What would we do if grace suddenly stopped? This is one of the most chilling but also most reassuring chapters that there are in the Bible. There, think for years, Noah had labored building this ark, preaching repentance, and God had said, I'm not always going to mess around with you contentious people. That's my version of whatever your Bible says. But well, you may have King James, New King James, NIV, CSB, Old Bob's version, or whatever, you know. But basically, he said, I'm not going to always tolerate your behavior. There'll come a day when it's over. And here we are, the last tree's been cut down, the last timber's been shaped, the last part of the pitch has been applied, and God's timetable, God's challenge, His time limit, if you please, is up. And so here in this chapter, we're going to find, at least I found, three things. And the first thing is, the dedication of this man called Noah. After he waited decades for people to repent, the Lord said to Noah, go ahead and go in the ark and take you and your whole family because I have found you righteous in this generation. Remember we talked about the uh, one of the theories about who the sons of God were that came down and and fell in love with the beautiful daughters of men, etc. And somebody suggested that was actually the line of Seth. Well, if the line of Seth were the sons of God, where are they now? Where are they when there's only one righteous man found on the earth? So if we're going to pick up on everybody in his brother's theory, we better come up with how we justify that theory. But... God told Noah, go in the ark. And I like this because that ark is just like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 says, He who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us as God, who also has sealed us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Noah was in that ark just like we ought to be in Christ. At least we have the opportunity to be in Christ. Over 60 times in the New Testament, believers are said to be in Christ. So he tells Noah, and here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this either so you don't get yakking about contradictions. He said, take seven of every kind of clean animal and bird. You say, well, I thought it was two and two. It was two of all the unclean. Seven of the clean. Why so many? Because number one, they got to have something to eat while they're on this plate. And number two, when they get done, they're going to have to make sacrifices. And uh, interestingly enough, 
Moses hadn't yet come up with his list of clean and unclean that he did in Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy 14, but they had animals that would be not only be available for sacrifice and available for food, but they would be animals left over when it was done to, be, to reproduce and replenish the earth. So he told Noah and his family to go in seven days before the rain was going to fall. I did think about this, and I don't know if you have or not, but for seven days after Noah and his family went in the ark, the door stayed open. Yeah, and at this time, God was having the animals go and think about the, the ravenous beasts and, and the food they ate, and everybody got along. They all went in. They went in on their own. Oh, Noah wasn't out there like the pictures you see with a stick driving them on board. He wasn't out there telling them which way to go. The animals came, and they entered the ark. But all this time, a whole week, the door is open. A whole week for the world that was out there to repent. But what are these people doing? Were they laughing and ridiculing this last week? The Word says that because of their sin and perverseness, they were continuing in their total disregard for the message and the picture. There's this boat sitting in this driveway. And they're just having a ball, laughing, making Noah jokes, you know, carrying on. But during that whole week, the animals, male and female, came into Noah, went in the ark. See, God, God won't pressure you. He'll just invite you. But nobody accepted the invitation. Now, I don't know. I mean, you can go look up how, an estimate of how many people were on the planet at that time, and it varies radically, but there were a bunch. They've been reproducing like crazy and living incredibly long lives. There's a lot of people. But not a single person went on that ark, except Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And then it says, once they got in, after the week was up, the floodwaters came. Verse 11 says there were two places. If you picture this, in the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows that were translates floodgates of heaven were opened. You talk about you're on the planet and all of a sudden underneath and above, just all comes together. There's even evidence today in science that the oceans contain water that at one point was subterranean, was underneath the crust of the earth. If you can imagine the earthquakes that broke up the deep, they didn't have a Richter scale, but it wouldn't have mattered. The deeps were broken up. All that subterranean water came up. The floodgates of heaven opened up, and all that water came down. But in the midst of all of this, we understand that like Noah, it can rest in that security in that ark. The Lord shut him in. See, that, that tells me that God is personally involved in the lives of his people. He, he had divine care and protect. This, this man and his family were special. They were important to the Father. They were somebody that he took the time to offer his care and protection as he ready to shut the door. What does that suggest to those on the outside? They'd had even that last week, but the season of grace was over. Matthew 25.10, you remember that. You say, oh, that's Old Testament. Let's go to the New Testament. The parable of the virgins. 
Five of them came with all ready to go. Lamps were full, ready to get going when the, when the door came and the call came. Five of them were off somewhere trying to find an open all-night oil store. But it said when the wedding call came, the door was shut. Here's another thing. One of the reasons I like Bible study, and I know some of you do too. In this section, we can see the protection of God displayed in the names of God. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, that ended the chapter we were in last week, it says, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. That word there translated God is the Elohim. Now, in the very next verse, which is our chapter 7, verse 1, it said, The Lord Yahweh, Jehovah, then said to Noah, and in verse 5, it was also the Lord, the Yahweh, the Jehovah, that shut the door. So so what? What's the big deal? What, what does it matter what if he's called by different names? Well, the Hebrew name in Genesis 1 for the powerful creator God is Elohim. In Genesis 2, we find the name Lord, which is the Jehovah, which is he which is, he who is present. People want to think of God as some great being off somewhere in the great by and by, but he's present. He's here tonight. That makes you uncomfortable? Good. I'm glad. But see, here's the thing. When, when God is dealing with people, the word Lord in its all capital letters is used, and that's the name Jehovah. When he's dealing with the animals going into the ark, with all of the other products of creation, with anything in the rest of creation, it's Elohim. It's the creator God. When he's dealing with his people, he's the protector God. I don't think it's by accident because God's relationship with people is different than his relationship with all the rest of creation. Noah was so secure in that ark because the Lord shut the door. Noah didn't shut the door. Rains were going to come, the floods were going to rage, but nothing could touch that ark because God sealed the door. And that kind of goes along with Romans uh, 8, 38 and 39. You remember that, don't you? Sure you do. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities or powers or things present or things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, the only thing that's not in that list, anybody notice that? You. The only thing that can separate you eternally from God is you. But see, if you're saved, you're like Noah. You're safe in the ark. You're safe in Jesus. But what about those on the outside? You know, once that downpour started, once that rain came and the oceans burst forth, and can you imagine Noah's neighbors? Right in mid-laugh. Can you imagine them come knocking on the door? pleading to come in. And no matter how badly Noah wanted them to come in, he could not open the door. Because Revelation 3, 7 says that he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. God opens the door, you can't close it. If God shuts the door, you can't open it. 
I still believe, and you've heard me say this many times, if they ever find that ark, they're going to find it all on the outside are going to be fingernail marks from all the people who were clawing to get in and couldn't. If that doesn't get your attention, church, I don't know what, what will. All those people, right up until the, what Matthew told us, right up until the day Noah went in the ark, everything was going on, business as usual. God shut the door. And then judgment fell. I can imagine Noah being a righteous man. He's probably heartbroken. Don't you suppose he's in there weeping at the sound of those cries coming through that wall? The people, the scratching, the kicking, the screaming. But he had witnessed, he had preached. I don't know if you've never been there. I know Pastor Barth, you can probably relate. Some, don't you ever some days wonder why? What's the point? You can do this for years and years and years and there's people who just won't budge. And you know what's going to happen. You know what's coming. And some of them may be living in your house. Or at least in your family. What, what do you think? You think this righteous man, the man who was right before God, wasn't in there heartbroken, crying? When judgment comes on our friends and our neighbors, are we going to know in our heart that we've done everything we can to bring them in to the security of Jesus? Jesus is the only ark that everyone is going to have to come into to escape judgment. And it's our responsibility to make that known to our friends and associates and neighbors because I know this is not a popular subject in church, but judgment is final. You say, well, God's grace is uh, you know, endless. It's boundless. There's going to come a day when he said, I'm no longer going to contend with you and your attitude. I'm not going to put up with it anymore. See, in the beginning, God brought order out of chaos. You remember that? Genesis chapter 1. Because his presence, his Holy Spirit, was hovering over the face of that chaos. Now, here in chapter 7, chaos is back. Forty days, the flood kept coming on the earth, and the waters increased, lifted the ark on high above the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. In the middle of that storm, in the middle of all of that going on, Noah and his family are safe. In the midst of all that chaotic judgment, Water covered the mountains by more than 20 feet. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Men, animals, everything wiped off the earth. Everything that had breath. And here's something I don't know if you've noticed, and I think it's meaningful, that after the Lord shut the door on the ark, God is not mentioned again in chapter 7. He withdrew his presence, his protective presence, and let the awesome fury of nature take over. We think, oh, the streets are flooding. Oh, we've got to go around because that intersection's underwater. Well, we've known it for how many years, and some individuals still drive into the middle of the puddle and drown their cars out. What? How many times do you have to do that? How long do you have to live in Wichita to know there's places you don't drive when it's rained hard for two or three days? But there's nowhere to go for these people. And it didn't just rain hard since Tuesday. It rained hard for 40 days round the clock. 
40 days, 40 nights, and the sewers backed up. No, wait. <clears throat> when God does it again, he said he wouldn't use a flood. He promised in an upcoming chapter. He won't do a flood again, but what's it say in 2 Peter 3.10? The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Anybody see that movie but me? Thief in the night? Yeah, you, none of you did. You're all too young. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. Elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Seems to me like just like the flood... God's going to withdraw his presence and let nature take over. As protection pulled back, catastrophic disaster when God pulls out because Colossians 1.17 says that in him all things consist. By him all things, the essential character, everything is comprised of, the glue that holds it together, the dark matter that keeps the atoms from exploding is Jesus. The Bible teaches us that this Jesus who's here today in the presence of the Holy Ghost is the thing that holds creation together. What's it going to be like when he says, that's it? I'm done. You've had your chance. you got to understand, see, God did not back off from what he said in Noah's day. He didn't back up. He didn't change his mind. He didn't say, oh, well, I'll give you another 125 days. He didn't do that, he said. And he's not going to go back on his word in the New Testament either. Judgment is coming. He saved those who had faith in him and in his word. And after giving every opportunity... He destroyed those who refused to believe. Because church, it's a choice. They had the choice and refused to believe. I still get one of my pet peeves as I listen to people call Thomas a doubter. He was not a doubter. He was an unbeliever. When does honest doubt become unbelief? Because he said, I will not believe until I see. That ain't doubt, church. That's a decision. And the people that are around us every day, oh, we can, we can throw things at our television and complain about the politicians, but every human being that has a brain that functions has a choice. And those of us that have made the decision don't see, well, how can they not make it? It's a no-brainer. Because where were you before you made that decision? I mean, after this thing was over, only Noah was left and those with him in the ark, and the water remained for a hundred and fifty days. Five months. I mean, how long do you think it takes to kill everything that's breathing? Don't you think that every living creature was already drowned? At five months, they're floating on the surface of the water. Don't you think to get an idea of how much God is, doesn't like sin and sinners? Are we supposed to preach when we do this? or Okay. Think of Noah. What's he doing? Here's a guy who lived and breathed habitually in a state of devotion. That's what he was for his, to be a righteous man. He, was, he, could, he could worship God in a, in a New York minute. You know, he didn't have to have any, anybody work him up. He didn't have anybody come along and, and get him all enthused and excited. And, and, and he was ready whenever... 
He was a man who lived and breathed this, having his exercise of faith had made him understand that God was his refuge. And so he didn't fear. For what the psalmist said in Psalm 46, 2 and 3, Therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There's way too much fear in people who profess to be Christians. Way too much. I'm not talking about awe and reverence for God. I'm talking about terror, abject fear. What was it did to Job's faith? The thing that I feared the most has come on me? We dwell in these things and we wonder how come they happen? Because you brought them on. Oh, I'll stop. The same God who opens and closes doors during this day of grace made us a promise through Jesus in Luke 11 and 10. Everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. When judgment comes, the door of opportunity for salvation will be shut by God himself. And nobody will be able to open it. So knowing that everything and everyone who does not know Jesus as their Savior is going to be destroyed what kind of life ought to we be living? Second Peter 3.11 Since all these things are going to end, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And I think every one of us has to be specific in how we answer that. We get... We get Way too much. We get by with way too much under grace. We live in generalities under grace because we don't have to be specific. Oh, well, you know, God will bless. I don't need to get down and pray. Oh, God bless so and so. What does that mean? What do you want him to do? You want him to make the decision? Oh, here, God, you decide. They need something cool. What do you want? Oh, I want you to bless them. What does that mean? How many of us pray specifically and how many of us pray generalities? Oh, Lord, bless our congregation. Our congregation is individual people. Who takes the time to pray for every individual person in the congregation specifically? He said, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And I'm going to leave it right there. Because hopefully in chapter 8, they'll get off the boat. But we'll find out. Amen. God bless you. Thank you again for being here. I mean, you could have used all those normal excuses. It's cold out, it's wet out, it's, 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 it's dark out. <laughs> Thank you for being here. God bless you. I hope he has. And I hope he does it to you specifically in your health, in your wealth, in your dwelling place. <laughs> Praise God. Let's stand together once more, if you can. And I'm going to just pass the magic buck and ask my brother Clayton, if he'll dismiss our service.